get to our next two here. The New Orleans Saints, their off seasons in 60 seconds. Fired off at Square P. P. Carmichael, replaced him with Clint Kubiak. They have a new offensive line coach, new quarterback coach, a lot of staff turnover. Signed Chase Young to a one-year $13 million deal. Also brought in Cedric Wilson and Willie Gay on smaller deals. Lost Michael Thomas, lost James Hurst, lost Andres Pete. Released Marcus May, let Zach Bond walk in free agency. Not an overly splashy offseason for the New Orleans Saints. Blue chip check-in for the New Orleans Saints. I'm very curious where you landed with this. Dude, I don't know if they have any at this point. Like, I think this team has a lot of above average to good players. I, I don't know if there's any single guy where I'm like, man, I am horrified that this guy's on the field against me. I'm tempted to give it to Demario Davis, even at age 35, purely out of respect. This is not like quite the same thing as Mike Evans. Yes, because he's been so good for so long. And the fact that he's still a good player at this age is remarkable. But you can make a serious argument that it's zero. And I don't know. I'm tempted to give them half of one for what Marshawn Lattimore was in 2021. Like, But that's just the entire conversation about this team even the guys who were dominant even the guys who were at that level are no longer at that level i love chris olave but he isn't there yet and like there are limitations to his game so i'm going to give them one with demario davis but i think you can make a very stern argument for zero what are the significant question marks you have about this depth chart Uh, you go a lot of directions with this you can go a lot of ways here. I think the easy one is offensive line. This was a bad offensive line last year. Oh, we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about that a lot. Um, the other safety spot um, is kind of a huge concern to me. And then honestly, the defensive end spot, I they do not have a lot going on there. Like the, in terms of body types, they have the guys they've always had where it's long arms, 275 pounds, push the pocket. But they don't actually have the production and star power that they used to in years past. So I'm pretty scared of what they have going on there. Yeah, I'm with you. The offensive line is is the biggest issue, and then we get pass rush juice. Like, where where is it going to be coming from as those guys get a little bit older and the young players that they've drafted just have not come along? So those are probably my two biggest ones. What are you watching the first month of the season with the New Orleans Saints? I want to know how this cornerback room shakes out, dude, because they have a lot of guys who can play. Obviously, you know, Marshawn Lattimore has been hurt the past couple of years. He's only played, I think like half their games um but when he's healthy he's he's a good player but who knows how long he's going to be healthy this year and then obviously he's going to be playing outside what is most fascinating to me is in 2022 Alante Taylor played a lot outside for them and he was really good as a rookie I thought um obviously a little bit up and down because he was a rookie but I just thought the way that he could get in people's faces um some of the way that he was just trailing on routes was just really quick really clean I really liked his play outside he got pushed into the nickel last year, did not look nearly as comfortable. I, I don't know if it was having more two-way goes from the nickel. Like, I don't know what, what exactly made him play much worse, but he just did not look like the same player. And obviously they have Paulson Adebo, who has also played inside and outside at certain points, mostly played outside in 2023. That was all true last year. But now they add Kool-Aid McKinstry to the mix, who is, again, an outside corner. Is he going to replace Adebo? Like, is, is he going to go play the nickel a little bit? I just... There's so many different ways that this cornerback room could go that I'm just fascinated to see where we get by the end of the first month. Where would you want to see it go? Like in your mind, what is the best combination of guys for them on the back end? The best combination is to me, probably Lattimore. I mean, obviously um, the nickel spot is the hardest to, to figure out because I don't think Adiba was actually very good at the nickel when he was playing it either. I think he looked better outside but so did Alante Taylor. So like, that's, I think the biggest problem with the cornerback room is they just don't have a guy who can play nickel. They have four guys who can play outside fairly well. (laughs) And I don't think they're going to push Marshawn Lattimore to the nickel. Um, So that's the biggest issue. I will say, even though Taylor struggled a little bit more out of the nickel last year, I am willing to maybe give him one more year of it because I, I liked him so much in his rookie season that I was like, man, he just seems like a player I want to bet on. I'll maybe give him another off season, another year to see if he can go put it together in the nickel. So I guess that would be the best construction. I will say, I hope by year's end, Kool-Aid is better than Paulson Nadebo. Um, you know, I don't think Adebo is a bad player, but I think if you draft a guy in the second round, you're hoping that he can be a little bit better than that. Give you something there. Yeah, I I also really liked Taylor uh, early in his career, and I I think that that's definitely worth watching. I was talking to a GM recently just about this and how his conception of the what you look for with your nickel corner has just changed over the last few years. Not only just in terms of value and in terms of usage, but what types of players you want to put in there. Because for so long, it was so tempting to just say, "Oh, a third guy will go in there." 
you know, like our third best guy or our smallest guy is that's who will play inside. And I think that some of the communication qualifications and just the intelligence you need to play that spot has changed the way that some decision makers and some good ones have thought about that nickel role in the defense. It's not just your third best corner. It's not just whatever your leftovers are. So the fact that they keep moving these guys in and out, I think is notable as you conceive of it that way. Is like, is there actually somebody who's suited for this or are you just slotting in the guy that you think is the worst outside corner on your team? No, that's a great point because I mean, I, when you're an outside corner, you're mostly a pass player, right? Like you still got to be in the run fit, especially in, in, out of certain coverages and certain looks, but you're mostly a pass player. When you're in the nickel, you're more like a safety or a linebacker where you're really thinking both at the same time. So it's it's definitely a different life you got to live inside. When I'm watching, what can Clint Kubiak get out of this offense? I mean, this is just going to be such a different style. It's, it's going to be such a stylistic shift from what they had done over the last couple of years. Derek Carr last year had 150 dropbacks with motion last season. That was 27th in the NFL, but dead last among full-time starters. Here are some guys who weren't full-time starters who had more motion dropbacks than Derek Carr last year. Joe Burrow, who played eight games, and their team doesn't motion, and he still had more than Derek Carr. Mac Jones, Kenny Pickett, Aiden O'Connell, all of them, more dropbacks with any kind of motion than Derek Carr had last year. He was also dead last in the percentage of his dropbacks with play action dead last among qualified quarterbacks like this was again they're trying to run the drew Brees offense with Derek Carr, yes. and it just i don't understand why and i think that they finally came to the realization that it's no longer worth hanging on to this old offensive model because we no longer have this quarterback so now they're just going to the offensive system du jour and i think that it's going to look a lot different than it did last year does that matter does that help is that going to suit Derek Carr? Like these are all worthwhile questions, but how this actually looks structurally, especially when you compare it to what it was, what was happening the last couple of seasons. I think that's my number one question about this team. I do kind of like it though. Cause I think this is going to be closer to what Derek Carr, Carr had when he had John Gruden as his mm -hmm. uh, play caller. Um, it's obviously it's a little bit different in terms of the way that it's structured, but this is a little bit more closer to the under center. We're going to run the ball more. We're going to try to, get some of this more motion we're gonna maybe roll you out a little bit more so i i do like that idea a little bit more but uh, yeah i'm kind of with you maybe the offensive line doesn't even really let them do this structure well so we'll see what is keeping you up at night about the 2024 saints it's the offensive line man like this unit is just it's not very good the interior is not very only, good yeah the interiors the thing is the interior is not good but i think it might be better than the tackles because trevor penning is nightmare status. I'm and not I don't even think trying to be mean about good. this. I'm not even trying to be mean about this. That is said as someone who did not walk, watch Lucas Patrick play a lot of football over the last couple of years. He is, <laughs> he is their starting left guard right now because Nick Saldaveri has been hurt. But I read Nick Underhill, who covers this team, you know, as thoroughly as anybody, he wrote this week that he's not even sure Saldaveri will get that job back when he's healthy. Lucas Patrick couldn't play center for the Bears in terms of holding up and the integrity of the pocket questions. The fact that he's now their left guard, Trevor Penning is their right tackle after he was borderline unplayable for stretches. And you have a college right tackle who was sold as a, pa as a run blocker now moving to left tackle. This has a very real chance to be the worst offensive line in the league and an offensive line that just sabotages your ability to be a decent offense from day one. I don't know if that will happen, but it is absolutely on the table. No, it, it is on the table. Um, You know, they're, the center and right guard situation, I think, are fine. I'm not too worried about those guys. But like you said, the other three is a potentially horrible spot. Flipping Fuaga, how often does a right tackle move to the left side? Like, it's just not a thing that happens often. Obviously, Tristan Wurst could go do it. But Tristan Wurst already proved that he was an elite player, right? Like, it just doesn't happen all that much. And so for a right tackle build as a run blocker, move to the left side. And then I didn't think he looked very good in his first preseason game. Obviously, I'm not going to kill a guy for one preseason game, but it was... Not an encouraging start. So I'm just, this could go south. It's, even if he's up and down as a rookie, like that's what you would expect. The problem is you have to, he has to be like their third best offensive lineman for them to be even a, a below average unit. So it's, there's so many questions. Like the floor on this is, it doesn't exist. Like they, they, it is so, so bad potentially. And in a way that could make the rest of the offense like borderline unwatchable. So mine was absolutely the offensive line. A secondary one here, the defense is just getting old. 
Like they were second in snap weighted age last year. They were 20th in weighted DVOA. They really fell off down the back half of the season. On a rate basis last year, Cam Jordan was in the bottom 10 among all edge rushers with at least 50% of the snaps, according to PFF, in terms of his pressure rate. And they just, it hasn't come together. Like the young pieces they needed to kind of revitalize that defense, Isaiah Foskey, Peyton Turner, they spent two first round picks on Marcus Davenport. The reinforcements just never came. So now you have all of these aging pieces and nothing to really prop it up. And Dennis Allen's done a phenomenal job as the defensive coordinator there. But I, I just worry that we're going to get to a place where, let's say the bottom falls out. It's all relative, right? It, this goes from being a team that every single year was a top five, six sort of defense to potentially being like the 23rd best defense in the league. And when you consider some of the questions about the offense, like that could lead to a very, very bad season overall. The scariest part is that this isn't for not trying, right? Like like you said, they have tried and drafted a bunch of guys, especially up front. I think they've done a decent job in the secondary, but almost everything they've done on the front four has not really turned out. Like they had they've drafted what, like five guys there, and none of them have really turned into a star player that I think they were hoping for. And so when that happens and Jordan is, I think, finally hit the cliff, or at least, you know, he's certainly hit the cliff. Not a good combination. Not a yeah, good they're combination. moving him inside on passing downs, and he, he's going through the. Uh, you know, it's a little bit disappointing, that's the old man but I'll move. do what I can to win. Yeah, I mean that that that's where we are with this group, and that is not a fun place to be. What are you most excited about with the twenty twenty four Saints? This this is not an easy one. Not an easy one, and it's like in conflict with what we just said about the offensive line. I think the receiving room has a chance to be really cool. How often will they? They've get got to show juice, it? man. Like Chris Olave yes. and Rashid Shahid, that that is a lot of giddy up with your top two receivers. That is vertical offense right there. Absolutely. And, and like it, the receiver room just makes sense to me, too, like a, a, as ideas. So o Olave is really good down the field, of course, but he's also kind of just a really good true one on one route runner, really good at beating yeah. man, just a guy who can always get open no matter the route. Shahid is almost like the inverse of the same thing where it's like. He's really exceptional down the field, but there's probably more true route running to him than you think that there is. Mm -hmm. Like when you just see some of his stats and see some of his highlights, like he's more of a real legitimate player. And then A.T. Perry, I I'm actually, you know, I'm not expecting anything huge from him, but he is a guy I like that gives him a lot of size. I think he showed um, the flexibility to play in the slot if they need him to as like a power slot. You can obviously play outside. He's probably their best red zone threat, him and like Jawan Johnson. So I think the room just makes sense. And I don't think their depth guys are that bad if they have to play a little bit. So this receiver room is really cool. It's just, again, we'll see how much they get to show it. Yeah, that's exactly where I landed. Like these, this is a chance to be fireworks if they can hold up even a little bit because of the how explosive those two guys are. But does it matter? I, I, and I don't know the answer to that. And I'm a little bit worried about what the final answer ends up being. Your most important supporting character on this year's Saints is... Yeah, so we talked about some of the moves they've tried to make in the front to to fix this thing and, and not be the oldest front in the league. Um, Brian Brzee, who they drafted last year at defensive tackle, I think he kind of got thrown under the radar with some of the other really good um, defensive front players that we got last year. Um, but he actually had a 9% pressure rate on 370 snaps last year, according to Sports Info Solutions. Same rate as Fletcher Cox, slightly low, or slightly better than Kobe Turner and Kalijah Kansi, who were two rookies that I think got a lot more pub than Brzee did. And you even see in Brzee's tape, like, He's kind of got some more moves and, and and he has really good power for a guy his size. Like he dude, even in this last preseason game, he was throwing some crazy spin news. I was like, I don't know if you need to do this as often as you are, but it's cool that it's in your bag. Um, so I respect it nonetheless. Um, so I just think if he could take that little bit of a step where he goes from, you know, maybe like this above average kind of rotational player to more of a solidified every down, really giving them something that could really help this front not be one of the worst in the league i think they, they need it from somewhere man they need yeah. it from somewhere and that's why mine is chase young you know we saw some flashes from chase young last year and you know i don't know I, I don't know there's health concerns and that was part of the reason that he was available in the way that he was part of the reason he only got a one-year deal i think that there are motivation concerns like there's a reason that he was available for what he was what he was this offseason can you get a step forward from chase young and can that injection of youth pop whatever similar with Brzee, allow you to be functional up front and allow this defense and some of the really good players on the back end to potentially carry you and so if they can get if he can be like a 
borderline like number one edge rusher for them like a solid number two that feels like a win considering the needs on this team right now if he can be like a jonathan grenard level pass rusher again just that would be a huge win yes that would be like absolutely perfect and chase young makes me sad man his rookie year like when he was really playing well early on he was an awesome awesome player so if we can even get 85 percent of that player back again i would be through the roof what counts as a successful season for this year's saints I mean, I've kind of said something like this for every team in the division, it feels like, because it's still wide open, but you got to win the division, right? Like, it's still such a wide open division that I think that, I that should... I don't know if you do, man. <laughs> I, re- I really don't know if you do. I-, I think you have to with the way that this offense is constructed, at least in terms of the skill players. This is an important, important framing. Success for who? Like, when you're saying they have to win the division, uh, who is that successful? Allen? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? Up. Okay, so th- I think this is important. For Dennis Allen, he needs to win the division. For the health of the franchise overall, I think the division race and even the win-loss column for this season doesn't really matter because that that's not where this team is. Uh, this is one of the first times, if you looked at the moves that they made, they're not pushing all their chips into the middle. They understand that a soft reset or a potentially hard reset is going to have to happen here over the next year or two. So I don't even think it really matters for the long-term health of the New Orleans Saints or even like the three-year outlook of the New Orleans Saints for them to be like a nine or 10 win NFC South champion. For Dennis Allen's job status, it absolutely does. But if you're trying to progress toward winning a Super Bowl, for me, all that matters is you finding building blocks with some of these young pieces. The drafts have been disastrous. They, they have been so bad recently, and that's why we're very close to the bottom falling out of this thing. And can the guys you drafted this year, Fuaga, McKinstry, even like a guy like Chris Olave, can he become a star? Does Fuaga look like a functional left tackle? Is McKinstry going to be a cheap building block next year if you move on from somebody like Marshawn Lattimore? That to me is way more important than any scoreboard results for this team because I think they're looking at 2025 and 2026. All right, you've sold me. I think as soon as you remove Dennis Allen from the equation, (laughs) it makes a lot more sense. Your irresponsible player prediction for the 2024 Saints. Uh, this one I think is is probably less hot than I think a lot of the other ones I've had, but I think by the end of the season, Kool Aid McKinstry plays the most outside snaps for this team, and the, part of the reason is Lattimore has just been hurt a lot for the past two years. He's missed literally half the games that they've played, and there's a chance that that happens again. He's only getting older, older and honestly, once quarterbacks start getting banged up, they keep getting banged up, uh, especially guys who who aren't bigger. So I think that that could be a problem. And then I just think McKinstry stylistically fits Dennis Allen's defense better than Paulson Adebo does. So I kind of think at some point he just plays over him anyway. So if Lattimore might get hurt again and McKinstry is, is, is better fit than Debo, I think he just ends up playing the most snaps. I don't have one. <laughs> no part of this team inspires any sort of like joy or creativity this is the most inconsequential team in the league and this is the most inconsequential season in the nfl this year i i'm i'm being honest i cannot work up any sort of enthusiasm about like what one player could do for this year's saints like this is a sim to end season for this team it's hard to even see what the best case scenario is so and like what would be the thing that drives them to the best case scenario so i'm i get it i get it I mean, like, I would love to see Chris Olave have a monster year, but even that, it's like, I, I can't bring myself to say he's going to have a 1,500-yard season when I look at the current state of the offensive line. Like, there's just nothing that gets me there. And I don't think they'll be the worst team in the league by any stretch, but they are the most inconsequential. And I don't think that's even a conversation. Like, at least the Raiders have weird curiosities about them. I'm excited to see what the Raiders defense does this year after what the back half of last season looked like. There's nothing even like that with the Saints. And I think their fans feel that way. And that's partially why I don't feel bad framing it that way. They're in football purgatory. There's always a team and they're this year's team. (laughs) 